Hello, I'm Ross Mould, AJ Bell's Investment Director, and welcome to Fundamentals, our regular analysis of the world of funds and collectives, where we look at the most popular purchases on the AJ Bell Invest Centre platform and then investigate why they might be so popular. Now this week, second on the list for actively run funds is First State Asia Pacific Leaders. Many advisors and clients will already be very familiar with the name, not least as it has a 12-year trading history, a 5-star Morningstar ranking and £8.1 billion under management. But it's the timing that's interesting, given the summer's turmoil in China's markets and indeed across emerging arenas overall. Someone, somewhere, seems to think there may be value to be had on a long-term basis and that fund managers Angus Tullock, David Gate and their team are more than capable of unlocking it. The OIC targets medium and large size companies which are based, or have a substantial portion of their operations in, Asia Pacific, including Australia and New Zealand. Holdings generally have a market cap which exceeds a billion US dollars. The aim is to generate long-term capital growth, and the portfolio style is relatively conservative, at least judging by a three-year beta of 0.75, a current cash holding that represents 9.5% of the fund and a near 95% portfolio weighting towards giant and large caps. Now for all that, the portfolio is pretty concentrated with just 47 holdings and the top 10 represent 42% of the funds. So anyone who buys First Date Asia Pacific leaders knows exactly what they're getting. And what advisors and clients tend to get is results. Tulloch, Gate and company have outperformed their benchmark, the dollar-denominated MSCI Asia Pacific X Japan, this year, as well as on a 3, 5 and 10-year view, according to this data from Morningstar, which shows the annualised returns over those periods relative to the benchmark. Such figures certainly help to justify the 0.9% a year ongoing charge figure, which is itself more than covered by the 12-month yield of 1.1%. Now, the year-to-date drop in 2015 may well be the result of China's woes and broadly emerging market upset, and anyone who takes exposure to the fund will be aware of the higher-than-average risks which come with putting capital to work beyond developed markets. Potential challenges include local politics, currency movements, and less well-developed corporate governance, to name but three. And including this year, First State Pacific Leaders has fallen three times over the past decade, on an annual basis. Yet the long-term story for investment in the region, growing populations, a burgeoning middle class and the potential for great economic growth in countries whose sovereign finances are generally much healthier than those of the Western nations, well, they remain undimmed. This may explain why the fund is one of the top 10 buys right now, although the potential for short-term lumps and bumps remains. As China reforms and opens up both its economy and financial services industry, the globe remains mired in a low growth, high debt environment, and the markets ponder the potential impact of any interest rate rise from the US Federal Reserve. One possible consequence of a rate rise would be dollar strength, and a strong greenback has traditionally heralded poor performance from emerging market equities, as this chart suggests. A surge in the dollar heralded the 1997-98 Asian financial crisis, and some advisors may be worrying we're about to see a repeat. Sovereign, Government debt levels are relatively low, but emerging market corporations have been active borrowers. Data from the Institute of International Finance suggests the total emerging market non-financial corporate bond market has more than tripled in size since 2008 to beyond $2.6 trillion, with over 40% of that sum in US dollars, an overseas currency, against 10 to 15% six years ago. This may explain the inverse relationship between emerging market equities and the US currency, whose strength would make servicing those debts more expensive, and this at a time when many Asian currencies are trading at multi-year lows. Now, this may be the greatest risk facing emerging markets in the short term, despite the long-term potential. So anyone looking at this fund needs to keep an eye on what Janet Yellen and the Fed are doing, as well as Tulloch and Gates' strategy. For the moment, India, Australia and Taiwan represent the largest geographic exposures at 24, 16 and 15 percent of the portfolio respectively, while China represents just 2.4 percent. This may appeal to advisors 
who want exposure to the whole region but remain concerned about events in Beijing and Shanghai. By sector, financial services and tech are both big positions, with respective weightings of 25 and 21 percent, while healthcare is a further 12. Despite the option to invest down under, basic materials are just 2.5 percent and energy 2 percent, so another area of market distress, commodities, looks to have been safely dodged along with that of China. It'll be interesting to see if these positions change in the coming months, and also whether that cash pile comes down to suggest Tulloch and Gate are taking a more aggressive stance. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.